How's it everyone? Shot for checking out the historian stash. My name is Dr. Jakub Seidnert, a real life historian. And this is Stashy, a real life animation. While we like to khoi some hidden and not so hidden stories of the South African past, we also like to dabble in some global historical events as well. But that's only one aspect of this channel. Stashy and I also present the historian's locker where we chat about sports stories which you may or may not have heard about. So there's something for you general history nerds as well as something for the sporting history nerds. Please like, share and subscribe to the historian stash to enjoy the best of both worlds and become a stasher. Okay, I know it sounds like you're joining a cult, but it's free to join up and we don't ask you for your ID book. Just subscribe you know you want to. Just do it. Do it. Now, without further ado, please enjoy this episode. Your assessment then, Mr. Prime Minister, blacks would not probably be fit for black majority rule within your lifetime. I don't believe in black majority rule ever in Rhodesia. Not in a thousand years. I repeat, I believe in black and whites working together. If one day it's white and the next day it is black, I believe we will have failed and I think it will be a disaster for Rhodesia. During the early 1960s, British government was preparing to grant formal independence to Rhodesia. However, the British adopted a policy of no independence before majority rule. This dictated that colonies with a substantial white settler population would not receive independence except under conditions of majority rule. White Rhodesians initially dismissed the notion with some feeling that they had a right to absolute political control, at least for the time being, given the post-independence chaos occurring in other sub-Saharan African countries. This is Africa, huh? But once Rhodesia became a topic for discussion in international bodies such as the United Nations, the existing state of affairs became increasingly difficult to justify to the rest of the world and gradually became an embarrassment to Great Britain. How's it? I'm Dr. Jakub Seynert, this is Stashy, and we've got Leo helping us out today. You're watching The Historian's Stash. Now, before we get started, I know that this topic is controversial, but generally speaking, history is controversial. It's sometimes brutal in its honesty, but also generous in its lessons. So please don't flip me off as either a libtard or a white supremacist, depending on which side of the political spectrum you find yourself on. Keep an open mind, and I really hope that you take something away from this episode even if it's just to come to the realization that no Hollywood actor can do a proper South African accent. Yeah. Anyways, the British colony of Southern Rhodesia was established as a legal entity in 1923, having earlier been occupied and administered by Cecil John Rhodes' British South Africa Company and its sub-concessionaries, who were mostly British. The colony was named after Rhodes, the British imperialist largely responsible for British expansion into Southern Africa. In 1953, Southern Rhodesia merged into the Federation of Rhodesia and Inyasaland, 
which lasted until 1963. When Northern Rhodesia became Zambia in 1964, Southern Rhodesia was renamed to just Rhodesia. I'm from Rhodesia. Now, in 1963, British Prime Minister Alec Douglas Home insisted that independence talks for Rhodesia should hinge on what he termed the five principles, namely unimpeded progress to majority rule, assurance against any future legislation decidedly detrimental to black interests, improvement in the political status of black Africans, moves towards ending racial discrimination, and an agreement on a settlement that could be acceptable to the whole population. When Harold Wilson, not to be confused with Harold Macmillan, and his incoming Labour government took office, an even harder line was taken demanding that these points be legitimately addressed even before an independence agenda could be discussed. Meanwhile, Meanwhile, Leo and his fellow white Rhodesians were growing more and more dissatisfied with the ongoing negotiations. This no fine, huh? This no fine. This led to the appointment of this oak called Ian Smith, Deputy Chairman of the ultra-conservative Rhodesia Front Party, as Rhodesian Prime Minister. He became the colony's first Rhodesian-born leader and personified resistance to the liberalism of the British government during the 1960s and 70s, as well as to black majority rule. Old Ian completely rejected all five principles as they stood, implying that Rhodesia was already legally entitled to independence. This claim was overwhelmingly endorsed by the registered white voters in a referendum held in November 1964. So Rhodesia threatened to go rogue by assuming sovereignty without British consent. Wilson responded by warning that such a move would be considered as treason. But Wilson's refusal to use military force against their English brethren encouraged Smith to proceed with a unilateral declaration of independence or UDI. Then, on the 11th of November 1965, Rhodesia's leadership issued its UDI, which was immediately denounced as an act of rebellion against the Crown in Great Britain. Some might call it that, yeah. UN officials also branded Smith's government as an illegal racist minority regime and called on member states to sever economic ties with Rhodesia, recommending sanctions on petroleum products and military hardware and the prohibition of Rhodesian export. However, the provisions set by the UN and Great Britain did little to deter other countries from maintaining trade relations with Rhodesia. Iran provided oil, while Japan imported more Rhodesian goods than any other country. South Africa openly refused to observe the UN sanctions even though it was a member, while Portugal covertly helped to export Rhodesian goods through Mozambique by marketing it on their own and supplying false certificates of origin. But despite the inadequacy of the sanctions, Rhodesia found it nearly impossible to obtain diplomatic recognition abroad. Even the South African and Portuguese governments did not recognize it as an independent state. Initially, the Rhodesian government wished to retain its pledged loyalty to the British monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, recognizing her as Queen of Rhodesia. However, the British governor, Sir Humphrey Gibbs, rejected the UDI as an act of treason. Gibbs used the powers of his office to dismiss Smith and his cabinet, but Rhodesian government ministers just ignored his notices, contending that the UDI nullified his office as governor and the powers that went with it. In 1968, the appellate division of the High Court of Rhodesia ruled that the Smith administration was not only the actual government, but also the legally recognized government of the country. Thus, it was entitled to lawfully do anything its predecessors, like Gibbs, had done. This paved the way for Rhodesia to become a republic. During a referendum held in 1969, the proposal for severing all remaining ties to the British Crown passed by a majority of 61,130 votes to 14,327. And so, on the 2nd of March, 1970, Rhodesia declared itself a republic. Magic! Under the new constitution, a president served as a ceremonial head of state, 
instead of the Queen, with the Prime Minister reporting to him. Some within the Rhodesian government had hoped that the declaration of a republic would prompt other countries to recognize them as a legitimate state. But this was to no avail. IR takes getting used to it. <laughs> Most scholars agree that the UDI and the subsequent declaration of republic was intended to only safeguard the privileges of the white colonial elite at the expense of the impoverished black African majority. In addition, it created a sort of vacuum of oppression which would later be filled by Robert Mugabe's dictatorship. Generally, the white population's attitude to the UDI was not all positive, despite the unanimous results of the referendum. Many white Rhodesians saw themselves as nothing less than fully-fledged members of the British Empire. That's right. But such a view was rudely shaken by the British government's refusal to grant them independence according to their terms. White Rhodesians continued to claim that they were the upholders of British principle, defending it against the threats of communism, militant black nationalism, and ironically, against British intervention. From 1968 until 1970, there was virtually no further dialogue between Rhodesia and Britain. However, after the election of a conservative British government under Edward Heath, negotiations were reopened. In November 1971, former Prime Minister Alec Duggar's home, now Foreign Secretary, announced a proposed agreement that would be satisfactory for both sides. Britain would recognize Rhodesia's 1969 Republican Constitution as the legal framework of the government, while agreeing that gradual legislative representation was an acceptable formula to move towards majority rule. In addition, it proposed an immediate improvement in black African political status, offered a means to end racial discrimination as a whole, and provide a solid guarantee against constitutional amendments that would undermine the provisions within the agreement. However, the Smith regime refused to submit it to a universal referendum, which would include black Africans. In 1972, a commission was tasked with getting a sense of public favor towards this new agreement. According to this commission, whites were in favor of the agreement, while black African response was resoundingly negative. This prompted Britain to withdraw its own proposal. Are you crazy? But Rhodesia's days were already numbered. After the collapse of Portuguese rule in Mozambique in 1975, Rhodesia was virtually surrounded by hostile states, making the situation untenable. Even South Africa's Prime Minister B.J. Foster had come to the realization. While Foster was unwilling to make concessions to his own country's black Africans, he concluded that white minority rule was unsustainable in a country where blacks outnumbered whites 22 to 1. Zanu, the Black African Nationalist Movement under Bob Mugabe had already pursued a military campaign for the liberation of Zimbabwe after the announcement of UDI. This campaign called for attacks on white farmers, destruction of cash crops, disrupting electricity in urban areas and petrol bombing. Funding and armed support provided by private companies and the Soviet bloc countries allowed ZANU's military wing, ZANLA, as well as Joshua Nkomo's ZAPU guerrilla army, ZIPRA, to acquire more sophisticated weaponry, thereby increasing military pressure on Rhodesia. I heard you got into a spot of trouble in the bush, eh? Ah, you know the bush, right, bro? <laughs> the brutality and intensity of the war increased from all three parties, with civilian casualties bearing the brunt. It's the way it's played out, hasn't it? Government bad, rebels worse. No one gives a toss in the Zanu and Zapu knew that the Rhodesian state's biggest problem in fighting the war was a shortage of manpower. Of the 3,000 white men liable for conscription in 1973, only about 1,000 reported when they were called up. In February 1978, the Rhodesian army stated that it needed a minimum of 1,041 men to continue combat operations. Of those, only 570 reported for duty while the rest chose to flee to South Africa. However, despite these massive shortfalls, the Rhodesian army consistently outfought the guerrilla forces throughout the war. Thus, in an attempt to encourage white emigration, the guerrillas followed the strategy of attacking anything that was of economic value 
in order to force the state to call up more men. They also deliberately targeted Rhodesian white civilians as it tended to have an echo effect, meaning that for every one white citizen killed, it caused 20 more to leave Rhodesia. The situation became even more desperate for Rhodesia when it began to lose economic and military support from South Africa. Pretoria placed limits on the fuel and munitions they supplied to the Rhodesian military. They also withdrew personnel and equipment that they had previously provided to aid the war effort. Old Ian wrote that even though many white South Africans supported Rhodesia, Foster's policy of detente with black African states ended up with Rhodesia being offered as the sacrificial lamb to buy more time for South Africa. Ian Smith's dream of Rhodesia was over. In an attempt to still clutch onto some sort of power, he negotiated with moderate African nationalist parties and agreed on national elections in which these parties could participate. The agreement was essentially a power-sharing arrangement between whites and blacks, assuring whites one-third of the seats in parliament, which was still a disproportionate representation. In addition, the country's police, military, civil service and judiciary were still under white control. But Ian was replaced as Prime Minister by the black moderate Abel Mutsarewa and Rhodesia was renamed Zimbabwe Rhodesia. Both ZANU and ZAPU rejected the agreement and the war continued. In 1979, the British government led by Margaret Thatcher invited all parties to attend a peace conference at Lancaster House. These negotiations took three months, eventually resulting in the Lancaster House Agreement. This would officially end hostilities, but political violence continued leading up to, during and after general elections. Despite this, the general elections were held in February 1980, with Bob's ZANU winning. In an ironic twist, Bob would be inaugurated as the first Prime Minister of an independent Zimbabwe, internationally recognized on the 4th of March 1980, only two days less than a decade after old Ian proclaimed Rhodesia to be a republic. We say Zimbabwe now, don't we? Do we? <laughs> Last time I checked. Mm. Ian became leader of the opposition, despite being regarded by many, especially by the ruling Zanu PF, as an unrepentant racist, whose policies and actions led to the deaths of thousands of people. His government would also be blamed as a contributing factor for many crises that would later grip Zimbabwe. However, Ian remained an unreserved critic of the Mugabe government before and after his retirement from politics in 1987. As Bob's reputation began to free fall amid Zimbabwe's economic ruin at the turn of the 20th century, Ian's legacy, to some, seemed to have been redeemed. Towards the end of his life, he was lauded by Zimbabwean opposition supporters as an immovable force of resistance. Ian Smith died in Cape Town in 2007. Bob, on the other hand, was initially portrayed as the heroic leader of the guerrilla forces who led his people to liberation against white supremacy. After his election as president, he was praised by Western observers for his attempts at racial reconciliation. However, relations with Nkomo and Zapu deteriorated, ultimately leading to the Gukarahundi of 1982 to 1987, resulting in Mugabe's military crushing Zapu opposition in Matabeleland. This resulted in the deaths of over 20,000 people, mostly civilians. Furthermore, in 2000, during his pursuit of decolonization, Mugabe encouraged black Zimbabweans to violently seize white-owned farms. Food production was severely impacted, eventually leading to famine, economic decline and sanctions from the very countries that had praised him 20 years before, most notably from Britain. Internal opposition to Mugabe grew, but he was re-elected numerous times through campaigns dominated by state-sponsored violence and electoral fraud. During his rule, he and his regime were accused of corruption, numerous human rights abuses and state-sanctioned terror. In 2017, he was eventually ousted in a coup orchestrated by members from the ZANU-PF as well as his military. 
Robert Mugabe died in 2019, leaving his country in socio-economic and socio-political ruin. It is undeniable that both leaders were complicit in the mess that Zimbabwe currently faces. Scholars argue that had the Rhodesian government adhered to British demands for majority rule earlier, that perhaps it would have saved Zimbabwe from a brutal war that perpetuated racial hatred and the radicalization of many black nationalist movements. If this did not happen, then perhaps radicalism within the black African population would not have been as prevalent, leading to the election of more moderate black African leaders through the popular vote. Be that as it may, Bob's role in the systematic oppression of his own people and the destruction of Zimbabwe's economy can never be overstated. Ian and his stubbornness might have laid the foundation for Zimbabwe's ruin, but Bob and his cronies are undoubtedly its architects. Yet Bob Mugabe is still praised by many black African leaders, especially in South Africa, as a liberation hero. According to the Black Scholar Journal, depending on who you listen to, Mugabe is either one of the world's great tyrants or a fearless nationalist who has incurred the wrath of the West. Similarly, Ian Smith and his regime have seen a recent surge in support, particularly from white supremacist groups as observed in a 2018 New York Times article. In this article, journalist John Ismay wrote, Photos on Instagram of soldiers marching through grassland and rivers, special forces units jumping out of helicopters and civilians posing in front of their homes with rifles, collected hundreds sometimes thousands of likes on posts seeming to offer tribute to a hardened and forgotten cadre of Cold War era bushfighters. Nostalgia for Rhodesia has since grown into a subtle and profitable form of racist messaging with its own line of terminology and hashtags. TIA. Social media figures and companies who trade Rhodesia themed merchandise denied that they endorsed white power messages. Others said that this newfound appeal lay in the Rhodesian government's anti-communist stance. However, it's also been observed that there's another more disturbing inspiration for it. In June 2015, Dylan Roof, an American white supremacist, killed nine black churchgoers in Charleston, South Carolina. Roof had written an online manifesto which appeared on a website called The Last Rhodesian with a photograph of himself wearing a jacket with a patch of the Rhodesian flag, right below a patch of the old South African flag. Right after this incident, demand for Rhodesian themed products actually increased. You Chris? It's apparent that old Ian and Rhodesia as well as Bob and Zimbabwe evoke polarized reactions. There's no real middle ground. Either they are adored or they are loathed. This trend of binaries is nothing new, but in a world which is rapidly becoming extremist, whether to the far left or to the far right, this is especially unnerving. And this is what the increasingly popular phrase, being on the wrong side of history, perpetuates. Historically, it can be understood that both Ian Smith and Robert Mugabe should be regarded as having failed their country. Right, whatever you want. I'm already dead. However, the phrase has been weaponized by groups who carry with them a specific political agenda, employing such an expression to distract attention away from their own weak or non-existent arguments. As philosophy professor Jim Spiegel notes, it's intended to mean two possible things. Firstly, that it suggests that as time passes, most people, perhaps everyone, will agree with the view in question. However, if a majority opinion dictates that the correct view is on a particular issue, then opinion overrides facts, thus leading to a logical error known in philosophy as the ad populum fallacy, or appeal to popular opinion fallacy. Even if everyone agrees with that particular view, it doesn't mean that it's true. For example, many people would agree that old Ian was on the wrong side of history due to his significant failures as a leader and his racist policies. Similarly, Rhodesia is predominantly remembered as a pariah state, doomed for failure. Ian and Rhodesia represented racism and white supremacy. Due to such an overwhelming condemnation against it, it was denied recognition and received very little international support against ZANU and ZAPU. 
This made it possible for those guerrilla groups to intensify their campaign against both black and white civilian targets, with little to no international criticism. These atrocities were either ignored or justified by outside observers to fit the liberation narrative. This ultimately paved the way for Bob to continue to commit crimes against humanity once he and ZANU-PF were in power and used it to criminalize any opposition against their regime. For instance, on the 15th of February 2016, the aptly named state-sponsored newspaper, The Patriot, printed an article claiming that David Coulthard, founding member of the Movement for Democratic Change or the NDC, was on the wrong side of history when he demanded that Bob apologize for the massacre in, in the Belliland. It went on to say that Coulthard was one of the Rhodesian residues responsible for massacres during the Liberation War. Simply relying on the majority as a moral yardstick is a dangerous exercise as it can be abused by those with a political agenda. The second possible meaning of on the wrong side of history is that it's said because the view in question will eventually be proven true. However, there is no substantive evidence to back this up. For example, the support for Rhodesia by white supremacists is based partly on the idea that old Ian had correctly predicted that black African majority rule would be a mistake if handed over to them in an irresponsible manner. In this narrative, the Smith regime is portrayed as a beacon of Western civilization in Africa where communism and black nationalism have devastated a once prosperous continent. This is Africa. Therefore, Great Britain and the other countries that refuse to recognize Rhodesia are proven to be on the wrong side of history, while Ian and his Rhodesian whites are the desperately outnumbered heroes fighting the communist threat. We fought and died together, you know? Black and white. This narrative completely ignores the oppression of the black African population, exploiting them for their labor and not even allowing them to properly represent themselves in government. Apart from this, historically it is clear that Rhodesia's position was unsustainable to such an extent that even apartheid South Africa eventually distanced itself from the Smith government. Thus, the grandiose and romantic fairy tale of white sticking together in the face of liberalism and the black and communist onslaught is also demonstrably false. Yeah, yeah. The history of Rhodesia's transition to Zimbabwe is complex and nuanced, and that's how it should be treated. History is full of nuance, because history is full of people. They are never binaries. There isn't one prevailing ideology pitted against the other. There is no absolute good versus absolute evil. History has shown this to be true time and again. However, due to the socio-political turbulence that has gripped the world, the popular debate has descended into a binary of extremism, and it's dictating how we view the past. This is dangerous, and it's to be avoided before we too find ourselves on the wrong side of history.